Um, uh, it, it gives me the pleasure from the Saudi Society of Men's Health uh, to have another um, scientific uh, meeting, uh, live webinar, uh, this time in an effort to cover all aspects of uh, men's uh, health issues. We are happy to host uh, two uh, distinguished uh, endocrinologists, and we will talk about an important topic related to men's health. And I'm sure most of us either overlooking this problem or lacking the significant knowledge related up to date information about it. We will talk about osteoporosis in the male and also associated hypogonadism. And uh, so again, I would like to welcome everybody attending with us uh, tonight meeting. And I would like also to thank uh, our uh, sponsoring company Amgen for uh, the great supporting and getting this uh, uh, initiative uh, live. Uh, I will start by introducing our moderator, who is Dr. Mitab uh, Al Utaybi, a consultant endocrinologist, and he is the general secretary for uh, Saudi Society of Men's Health. I would like just to have a few reminders uh, before we start kicking in. This webinar is recorded and will be inshallah available at the website of the Society YouTube channel. Uh, if you have any questions related to the content or the subject of this meeting, please put it down in the q and &E section. Uh, uh, your mics uh, are muted, so there will be no uh, voice uh, questioning, but we will be happy to answer all related questions in the Q&A section. Uh, I will leave the podium for you, Dr. Mitab now. Uh, thanks, Prof. Uh, Saleh. Uh, I'm happy to moderate uh, this uh, webinar tonight. I am lucky to have uh, the chairman of Saudi Society of Men's Health, uh, Prof. Saleh bin Saleh. He's a consultant urologist and andro-urologist, and he will help us tonight. Our main speaker for tonight, I appreciate uh, Dr. Mhaya. Dr. Mhaya is consultant endocrinologist and metabolic bone disorders. He is uh, the head of the uh, osteoporosis unit in large endocrine center uh, in King Fahad Medical City, endocrine obesity metabolism center. He is also a board member of Saudi Osteoporosis Society. He published many research related to our topic. Uh, thanks, Dr. Mohammed, for jo uh, joining us tonight, and you are the main speaker. And we will stick to our schedule and start with you for upcoming 25 minutes about this important topic. Mike, for you, Dr. Mohammed. Assalamu alaikum, hayakum Allah jami'an. Thanks, Dr. Mitab. Thanks, uh, Prof. Saleh, for inviting me to present today. And my main topic it will be about uh, osteoporosis in men, with the focus that will be on uh, male uh, hypogonadism. I will share with you my slides so we can start. So. Uh, so let's start. So uh, outline of my talk today it will be about uh, some epidemiological facts about osteoporosis and the fractures in men. We'll be talking about some uh, pathogenesis, why uh, osteoporosis occur in men, uh, what's the effect of male hypogonadism on the quality of the bone and the fracture also, how can we diagnose osteoporosis in men, and what are the treatment options available for us. So let's start with this case scenario. A 70 years old man, who comes to you with the symptoms that suggestive of hypogonadism in form of decreased libido, a decreased morning erection, also a loss of muscle mass and some fatigue that he reported. He denies any uh, history of smoking or alcohol intake, no prior history of fractures before. Uh, he lost around six centimeters, so that's, we have to keep it in mind in regard of either kyphosis or vertebral fracture, which is the most common fractures that occur uh, related to osteoporosis. So DEXA scan has been done for him, and why it's done? Because he's older than age of or uh, 70 or plus, and he's having also some secondary causes of osteoporosis like hypogonadism. So DEXA scan that has been done showed the T-score of minus 2.6 at the spine, femur neck of minus 2.2. So uh, uh, during my presentation, we'll be talking about how to approach such a case. Uh, 
this in general, as you mentioned, uh, Prof. Saleh, it's might be, it might be underestimated. The prevalence is high. It's a silent disease. Worldwide, uh, osteoporotic fracture occur every three seconds. When we compare uh, the data from uh, women, around um, one out of three women in postmenopausal uh, status, there will have an osteoporotic fracture. What about in men? around one out of five men will experience uh, osteoporotic fracture. So that's quite high percentage. 20% of men will experience osteoporotic fracture after age of 50. Uh, what are the consequences of osteoporosis? When we talk about consequences in regard of osteoporotic fracture, around 20% of all osteoporotic fracture occur in men, around third of all hip fracture again occur in men, Vertebral fracture occur almost 50% in comparison to women. So it's a quite high percentage in comparison to women. We know that the higher prevalence of osteoporosis occur mainly in postmenopausal women, but again, the risk of fracture is high also in men. The most concerning one is the mortality rate. Mortality rate after hip fracture in the first year, 38% of men, they will die in the first year after their hip fracture. So that's of concern, of course. Uh, when we talk about what is the incidence of, of fractures in men and women, uh, so uh, we have like bimodal uh, curve. As we can see here in the figure, we have small beak that's occur in uh, adolescent and early um, adulthood, perhaps because rather than osteoporosis. Later on, we will have a dramatic increase in the risk of osteoporosis as we are getting older. As you can see here in the figure, yeah, men tend to have an osteoporotic fracture that's okay around 10 years later in comparison to women. When we talk about some epidemiological uh, data uh, from uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, based on the study that has been done by, done by Prof. Sadat from the Eastern region, uh, this meta-analysis showed that the prevalence of osteoporosis in both postmen, postmen, women and men is quite high. Uh, if we look at the men uh, quarter, so around more than 75% of all men above age of 50 either having osteopenia or osteoporosis. Keep in mind some limitation of these studies, uh, in including that the DIXA that has been used uh, using uh, or the data from the tertiary hospitals, high prevalence of uh, secondary causes such as vitamin D deficiency, thalassemia, and sickle cell disease in the Eastern region. But again, it's a quite high percentage if we look at the prevalence of osteoporosis in Saudi in comparison to the inter international figures. Again, not only osteoporosis, but also the osteoporosis related the fracture. As you can see here, again, well, Prof. Sadat mentioned that the vertebral fracture around 13% in men above age of 50 in comparison to 20% uh, in women. Uh, so again, the vertebral fracture risk is high. We don't have much of proximal femur or hip fracture, perhaps because the life expectancy in our population is uh, less in comparison to Western countries. When we talk about uh, definition of osteoporosis, we know that osteoporosis is not about bone density alone. It's a microarchitecture deterioration of the bone, which leads to weakening of the bone and therefore increased risk of fracture. So when we talk about osteoporosis, it's not about bone density, it's uh, also the bone quality. So the bone strength component is a bone density and also bone quality. As you can see here in the figure, the normal healthy bone in the left side. In the osteoporotic uh, uh, bone, you will have um, more of loss of trabeculi, thinning of the trabeculi, and also loss of the cortical thickness. As you can see here, that will predispose patients or individuals to higher risk of fractures. When we talk about bone mass, in usually we will have our big bone mass by age of around 20, 25, things will be plateau, and men tend to have a slowly decline or gradual decline that's occurring in regard of their bone health. And women, they will have a rapid decline that's occurring mainly following menopausal status, will have a rapid decline that's uh, occurred 10 years later with the menopause, then again, things will start to decline gradually. 
why fractures are less common uh, in men in comparison to women, uh, perhaps because of the greater big bone mass that will be achieved in men in comparison to women. They have larger bone size in general with a greater muscle mass, more active and fewer fall risk. Uh, the most important factor maybe is the absence of menopause where they have a decline uh, or rapid decline in their bone health. Uh, shorter life expectancy. So we know that the fracture occur later in life. Women have longer half-life or longer life expectancy. Perhaps that's one of the reasons uh, in regard of statistics why the men have lower fracture rate. When we talk about why men uh, uh, will have, uh, why men will have, uh, 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 or the bone loss that's occurring in men, what are the factors that might contribute to that? We can classify that to two groups. First is the primary cause, and the second is secondary cause. And the message that I would like to deliver, if you have osteoporosis in men, always think of secondary causes. Secondary causes contribute to almost 40 to 60 percent of all causes if you have osteoporosis in men, again, think of secondary causes. There are rules of six steroids and hormonal changes that might contribute to bone loss. When we talk about that, we know the effect of testosterone either directly by comparison to the, uh, the, the hydrotestosterone and acting with the androgen receptors in the bone also, or indirectly by the effect of stradiol, perhaps that the predominant effect is the effect of stradiol that uh, will be converted or uh, the conversion that's occur from testosterone by the action of aromatase enzyme. Both testosterone and estradiol will decline with age in men, as you can see here in the figure, uh, a decline that's occur gradually as we are getting older in both total testosterone, bioavailable testosterone, and the other hand also the estradiol, and the bioavailable estradiol. So is it the effect of estrogen or testosterone that will have an increased risk of fracture and declining in the bone in regard of men? So uh, there are many studies that address this issue, but perhaps the most strong one is the association in regard to fracture as uh, the level of estradiol going down below 16 picomol per millimeter will have a dramatic increase in regard of fracture risk. So uh, perhaps the predominant effect was seen with the estrogen, but uh, nothing or uh, not to miss that the effect of estrogen that will act also in the osteoclast and osteocytes that might contribute also. But mainly the predominant or the dominant effect is perhaps because of the estrogen effect. Again, other hormones that might contribute, we have the insulin growth factors, we have the growth hormone also that might contribute to, to bone loss. We have also the parathyroid hormone and its effect on the bone. Uh, also vitamin D, if we consider it as a hormone, vitamin D play a major role also in regard of bone health. In this table, we try to summarize what are the secondary causes that contribute to bone loss in men. Uh, as you can see here in the figure, a lot of secondary causes that might cause, including diseases or medication that might contribute to bone loss, lifestyle, general and genetic factors that might contribute to bone loss. Uh, uh, of concern here is the hypogonadism, or we are talking about hypogonadism in men, so hypogonadism account for almost th uh, third of all uh, secondary causes that occur. 16 to 30 percent of among all causes of secondary causes uh, of osteoporosis in men. So it's a quite high percentage uh, to look for the hypogonadism, especially if uh, patients uh, presented with the symptoms. Uh, so how can we diagnose patients with osteoporosis? We'll come to that. So back to the scenario, does this patient has osteoporosis uh, with a T-score of minus 2.6? Uh, the answer is yes. And why is that? Because of the criteria that has been published by the um, WHO a long time ago that address what is the criteria for diagnosis of osteoporosis in men above age of 50. Uh, perhaps it's almost uh, similar to what, what has been published in regard of postmenopausal women, minus 2.5 or below its equivalent to osteoporosis. 
Furthermore, the AIDS and also in the society address what are the clinical diagnosis of osteoporosis. So uh, as we mentioned earlier, bone density is not alone. So that having T score of minus 2.5 or below at lumbar spine, femur neck, total hip or distal radius, that's equivalent for osteoporosis, or we will establish the diagnosis of osteoporosis. But again, that's not enough. We have uh, also other uh, uh, criteria to diagnose osteoporosis. If you have a fracture that is related to osteoporosis, talking about vertebral, which is the most common vertebral uh, osteoporotic fracture, or again, hip fracture, regardless of their BMD. Again, regardless of their BMD, if you have vertebral fracture, hip fracture, that's equivalent for osteoporosis. If you have osteopenia, uh, based on the criteria that we mentioned before, uh, in presence of fragility fracture that occur in non-vertebral area, including humerus, pelvis, or distal forearm, that will be equivalent for uh, osteoporosis. Uh, of course, we will exclude those fractures that occur in fingers, toes, and the skull. Ankle perhaps is not counted as uh, also a fragility fracture. When we talk about also osteopenia, there are uh, fracture risk assessment tool that we'll be addressing uh, in a few minutes. So if you have osteopenia with high frax threshold, uh, so that's a, again an uh, indication for osteoporosis or we we'll label these patients as osteoporosis. So what are the indication of PMD testing when we have to screen patients with the DEXA scan? So again, this table, we try to summarize uh, uh, the, the indication of PMD testing that has been uh, published from different organizations. As you can see here, different organizations have different protocols and different criteria to uh, establish or to screen patients with osteo or individuals with osteoporosis. Uh, in general, if you have uh, men above age of 70, so it's preferred to screen them for osteoporosis or uh, more than 50 to 70 plus risk factor that's including those lists that we mentioned, medication or diseases that might contribute to bone loss, uh, history of fractures so that's related to osteoporosis. So perhaps those patients or individuals need to proceed with um, you know, or need to screen with a DEXA scan. Uh, the ideal is that the technique is the DEXA scan. What about uh, guidelines here in uh, Saudi? Saudi guidelines uh, has been published in 2015, uh, mainly address the postmenopausal women, uh, but no, uh, no recommendation regarding of uh, male osteoporosis. We talk about FRAX. So a FRAX is a tool that will help to capture those patients at high risk of fracture. We talk about bone density, that is not enough. Maybe if you have 60% uh, of the patients, uh, they will have a fracture while they're in the osteopenia range. How can we capture those patients? So one of the modalities is a fracture risk assessment tool uh, that has been uh, uh, used in, uh, or currently used to predict what is the 10-year probability of having a fracture. So that's a helpful tool. If you have patients with osteopenia, uh, so, and no uh, fractures that related to osteoporosis regarding vertebral hip or non vertebra, and you want to make sure that does this patient uh, uh, qualify for uh, osteoporosis therapy, we can proceed with the PRAX. If you have a major osteoporotic fracture that's exceeding 20%, as you can see here in the um, so that's equivalent for osteoporosis. If you have hip fracture that's exceeding 3%, again, that's equivalent to osteoporosis and patients need to be treated. In regard of a laboratory, we have a basic workup. I would like to emphasize about bone profile, CBC, vitamin D, but uh, the most important uh, thing for our topic today is that having two uh, samples of fasting, a serum testosterone to establish uh, and, and also LH to establish um, yeah, the diagnosis of hypogonadism uh, in the presence of uh, hypogonadal symptoms. Uh, so uh, having hypogonadal symptoms, we will proceed with uh, two samples, early morning fasting serum 
to testosterone as recommended by Endo Society in 2012. There are uh, other uh, la uh, laboratory tests that uh, perhaps will proceed uh, uh, to that according to the uh, a clinical uh, or additional test might be appropriate in uh, some uh, clinical scenarios uh, based on uh, individuals. So what are, uh, what is the treatment options? Uh, first, I would like to highlight that the treatment aims to prevent fracture. So the treatment for osteoporosis aiming to decrease risk of clinical fracture. We have non-pharmacological and pharmacological therapies available that will uh, be addressing in the next uh, five, 10 minutes, general preventive measures and life measures that we'll use. Of course, we are advising our patients for weight bearing exercise, 20 to 30 minutes a day, taking adequate calcium from diet, and perhaps supplements might be necessary in some situation, taking uh, adequate vitamin uh, D, mainly from supplements, vitamin D from the sun exposure might be unreliable uh, as we are getting older, smoking cessation, and also the most important uh, factor for at high risk fall is the fall prevention programs and fall prevention strategies. The recommendation that has been published by the Endo Society in 2012 they recommend those uh, men at high risk for fracture, we need to treat them. If you have hip or vertebral fracture, treat. Again, if you have T-score of PMD of minus 2.5 or below, we need to treat. Uh, probability of a fracture that's exceeding the threshold to treat, again, that's an indication for treatment. And also, uh, that's a different or topic if you have long-term glucocorticoids based on um, um, the criteria that has been published by uh, American College of Rheumatology. If you have a glucocorticoid therapy that's exceeding three months uh, with the equivalent dose of 7.5 or 5 milligram for high-risk patients. So uh, those are the approved therapy uh, that has been addressed by the Endo Society. If you have, um, you know, so we have um, both anti-resorptive and also anabolic therapies that has been approved. We know that it has been approved for both menopausal women, but again, it has been approved for treatment of osteoporosis in men in regard of prostate cancer. And uh, we have uh, two options, sulfuronic acid and denosumab, and we'll come to that. And in regard of uh, having symptoms that suggest fibrogenadism with a level that it's low, below 200 or 6.9, uh, so testosterone therapy, uh, we will do uh, the, the trick in regard of PMD. Uh, so uh, in regard of testosterone, the longest data that we have uh, based on this study that has been published uh, uh, in 2016, it's the effect of injectable testosterone and the, its effect on a bone mineral density, uh, 120 hypogonadal men uh, with the mean age of 65 treated with this uh, intramuscular injection of testosterone for about five to eight years. What happened in regard of PMD? There was a significant improvement in regard of PMD, uh, both at lumbar spine, uh, that's occurred earlier as two years, and femur neck, that's occurred later because of the cortical bone component, that's occurred later in uh, life. With, uh, with a good safety profile, actually, with this testosterone injection. Um, um, uh, but this study, again, didn't address the uh, fracture uh, outcome, BMD changes that has been the main outcome for this study. So again, uh, oral testosterone that has been studied, both studies uh, from the, um, from the uh, East Asian uh, studies, so 186 hypogonadal men, above age of 60 with established diagnosis of osteoporosis at baseline based on the densometric criteria random, randomized to three groups, low dose of testosterone orally or the standard dose of 40 milligram of indriol or placebo. The outcome, as you can see here, there was a significant increase in the lumbar spine that was seen in both, in both doses, a low dose and the standard dose of testosterone Femur neck, again, we have a similar improvement that's okay in regard of uh, um, uh, two doses. It was not seen in the placebo. So both doses, uh, the low dose and the standard dose, uh, they have a significant uh, increase in regard of both lumbar spine and femur neck. 
when we talk about testosterone therapy, we have to think what are the benefits uh, and uh, in contrast to the possible uh, risk factors that occur. We know that with the beneficial effect of testosterone in regard to improvement of the hypogonadal symptoms, muscle strength, fat-free mass, and also uh, the BMD improvement, we don't have enough data that suggests that uh, uh, fractured data is available to, to emphasize on the point that testosterone is a, 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 an osteoporosis therapy. But a BMD improvement is a useful um, uh, is a useful marker for that. In regard of possible side effects, we have to watch for the uh, possible or query uh, growth of metastatic or uh, subclinical prostate cancer, erythrocytosis, higher prevalence of cardiovascular event or heart rate, worsening of the obstructive sleep apnea, or worsening of their lower uh, urinary tract symptoms. So it's uh, we have to balance. Uh, according to the individuals, what are the beneficial effects in regard or and uh, in contrast to the possible side effects that occur with testosterone? Uh, in this uh, table, we try to summarize what are the outcomes uh, from different studies in regard of uh, pharmacological therapy in general, not only in hypogonadism. As you can see here, with the bisphosphonate, we have three options, alendronate, resendronate, and zoledronic acid. The available in the kingdom is alendronate and zoledronic acid. We have a nice improvement in regard of PMD. Vertebral fracture risk reduction data is there. And, sub, um, and, and also subgroup analysis uh, for hypogonadal men was addressed in two studies, alendronate and resendronate, and showed the beneficial effects of uh, both uh, uh, BMD and also fracture risk reduction in regard of alendronate and resendronate in those patients with hypogonadal uh, symptoms. When we talk about other treatment uh, options, we have denosumab, which is quite uh, um, a useful medication in regard of uh, uh, anti-resorption, BMD improvement, uh, also vertebral fracture risk study in men uh, was done on those prostate cancer receiving androgen debriefation therapy. It's not for general, but only for those prostate cancer patients who's receiving androgen debriefation therapy. We know the androgen debriefation therapy has uh, a dramatic effect uh, in regard of bone loss. Uh, we will have a bone loss that took care as fast as er or as early as six to 12 months. Donizumab will decrease risk of fracture by around 50% or more in those, kind of, or in those uh, group of patients. Teribartide, it's anabolic that will build up the new bone. Again, it has been approved for treatment on osteoporosis in men with a significant BMD improvement. Uh, if you can see here, the vertebral fracture risk reduction was not significant, perhaps because of smaller size, uh, sample size in this study, but there was a trend towards significance with a B value of minus of uh, uh, 0.07. So uh, teribaratide is still one, uh, uh, one of the excellent choices that we have for high-risk patients. Again, testosterone for only hypogonadal men. Uh, so we have a nice improvement in regard of PMD. Unfortunately, we don't have enough data in regard of fracture. So uh, uh, to summarize my talk in general, I will end up with the two slides from Indo Society, management of hypogonadal men at high-risk uh, patients. Uh, so if you have high-risk individual for a fracture, testosterone alone is not enough. We have to add one of these approved agents uh, with anti-fracture efficacy. Uh, so that's the most important mes message that I would like to deliver. If you have a borderline, hip uh, high, borderline high fracture risk, so uh, we can consider testosterone those kind of patients who doesn't have vertebral hip fracture, who doesn't have osteoporotic fracture, early uh, in their um, um, uh, adulthood life, talking about around uh, uh, early 50, I mean, to 60, perhaps without uh, fracs that's exceeding the threshold, maybe we'll consider testosterone therapy alone for those kind of patients who are not very high risk for fracture, and we can repeat their BMD after one um, uh, year, and if things are improving, that's well and good. If not, we have to consider something like the anti-resorptive or uh, an, uh, anti therapy for treating their osteoporosis. Uh, the recommendation again, again from the Indo Society to stop testosterone if there is no improvement regarding symptoms in three to six months.
So summarizing my talk, osteoporosis is a common problem that we face in men also. It's not only in boys, many boys are women. Uh, if you have osteoporosis in men, always think of secondary causes, 50, 40 to 60 percent, uh, you will find the secondary causes for now, osteoporosis. To diagnose, you have either densometric criteria or clinical criteria by presence of fragility fracture. Hypogonadal men at high risk for fracture need uh, an approved agent with the anti-fracture efficacy in addition to testosterone that will be for uh, their hypogonadal symptoms. Testosterone might be sufficient for subgroup of patients with lower fracture risk. With that, I would like to conclude. Thank you and the uh, mic for you, Dr. Mate. Uh, thanks, uh, Dr. Al-Hayya. I really appreciate uh, this amazing presentation. Uh, I need also Prof. Saleh to be with us. Now we will uh, start. Uh, I want to our. Uh, we'll start our. Uh, I will move now with interactive cases. Prof. Saleh, are you with us? Yes, I'm here. Just a minute. I will share my screen. What? Are you seeing the screen now? No. Are you seeing my screen? <clears throat> no, it's not there. Uh, just a minute. Now? Not yet. Are you seeing the screen? No, it's still not there. It will be just a minute. Yes, now. Okay. Are you seeing the case? Uh, this is 71 year. This is 71 year old, uh, 71 year, year old male. Uh, I want also audience to concentrate because they will uh, choose the choice. History of prostate cancer, post surgery and external beam radiation three years ago, and he had mild back pain since five months. He's on vitamin D and calcium and also in terms of hypogonadism. Is a BMI 25 and he in examination has tenderness of a little Labs show work secondary causes other than hypogonadism were negative. Dexa scan and lumbar were minus 2.5, femoral minus 1.7, frax below treatment three shot. Total testosterone level was 290, BSA undetectable. The question what's your plan for this patient? Testosterone alone, this was or denizumab. Teriparatide or combination of all. Please, foot, this is your time. Please choose the best answer you think. This is for all audience. Please uh, choose what do you think it's right. Testosterone alone, bisphosphonate or denizumab, teriparatide or combination of testosterone and bisphosphonate. I think uh, Dr. Al-Hayya discussed it uh, in his presentation. And they hope the majority will get the right answer. Okay, can we see the results? We have half of the attendees uh, finished the polling. Would you like to wait a little or uh, share? We the can. Assistance? We will wait for uh, other five seconds. Then we can move. Because maybe many of them just will get five seconds, then we can stop it. So, can you see the results? Because we will move uh, in the discussion. Okay, what's where is the results? Not a beauty. Okay, now we can see no answer from the majority, uh, almost the majority, it and uh, 31 percentage or the dirizumab, while the others choose testosterone alone or triparatide or combination of testosterone bisphosphonate. Start with you, Dr. Al Hayya. What's your comment? So, yeah, I agree, with the, I agree with the majority that bisphosphonate or dirizumab will be the right choice in this uh, scenario. Uh, um, perhaps uh, Prof. Uh, uh, Saleh will uh, be talking about the testosterone in, uh, in that. Uh, but 
this patient has no symptoms that should suggest of hypogonadism. From the case scenario, also there is tenderness that we have to look for that in regard of X-ray of lumbar spine to rule out vertebral fracture. Rolling out secondary causes is there, so that's very important. And his uh, T score of minus 2.5, so we need to treat this patient. He's at high risk for fracture. The best available options that we have here is the bisphosphonate or denosumab, cerebratide in regard to prostate cancer, active malignancy, history of radiation will be contraindication. So bisphosphonate or denosumab, if you have to choose one, again, from both bisphosphonate or denosumab, with the denosumab, we have a proven uh, anti-fracture efficacy in regard of uh, osteoporosis in men and the prostate cancer patients. So maybe it's a useful alternative option is zoldronic acid in such a scenario. Yes, in regard of testosterone. Uh, yeah. Uh, Dr. Uh, Prof. Saleh, uh, what do you think about this patient? Uh, little bit low testosterone, 290. What do you think about this patient? No, I understand this is a total testosterone. So if you do a free testosterone, it will be much lower. Uh, it is very interesting case, uh, keeping in mind this is a case of previous prostate cancer patient who underwent surgery and external beam radiation. And usually when we do that combination between surgery and external beam radiation, we're talking about uh, a locally advanced prostate cancer or unfavorite uh, type of prostate cancer. But anyway, this was three years ago. So I'm assuming now, since his PSC is undetectable, he is cured, at least for the time being. Now, uh, putting him on testosterone, when it comes to symptoms, there is no sexual related symptoms. I understand from the point that was left in here. But in addition to the bi biochemical evidence of low testosterone, he has um, an osteoporosis, so that might be a good indication for testosterone replacement therapy. The question that comes now, how safe is to put him on testosterone as he is a, a previous prostate cancer patient? And we know from just physiology that prostate cancer growth may be influenced by testosterone. This is fact number one. And the fact number two, we know that also studies have reported hypogonadism is associated with a lower incidence of prostate cancer. So people with low testosterone are more protected against prostate cancer. On the other hand, if you have a patient with a prostate cancer and hypogonadism at the same time, we're talking about a badly or aggressive disease of prostate cancer, because usually hypogonadism is a protective agent against prostate cancer. Now, the question that comes now here, is it safe to put the patient on testosterone replacement therapy, keeping in mind that he has a previous history of prostate cancer that was treated, but that was three years ago. Now, the observational and meta-analysis studies indicated that testosterone therapy does not increase the risk of developing a prostate cancer in a guy who has no prostate cancer to start with. And also, there is no type 1 or type A or A level study that indicate also prostate cancer get worse in a patient with a previous history of prostate cancer if he is already treated and cured. But there should be a, a limitation for this. So if we are going to put a patient on a testosterone replacement therapy with a previous history of prostate cancer, that cancer have to be cured at least for one year. And also that cancer have to be from the type that is mild or not aggressive type. And usually we judge this on on the histopathology analysis of the prostate tissue, we call that Gleason score from the urologist, also by the level of the PSA, and also the uh, the uh, pathological staging of the cancer. And this is lacking in this uh, information, so we don't know how bad it is. But putting together surgery and external beam radiation might be an aggressive type prostate cancer, however he's cured for now. So he have to wait for at least one year. His PSA should be undetectable, and he have to be at a good type of prostate cancer. That should not preclude him from putting him on testosterone replacement therapy to treat his mineral density problem. Uh, but that patient have to be under very close, strict follow-up to and follow-up in mirrors of PSA and, and, and rectal examination and uh, imaging study to make sure that he, he will not recur back. Although we don't have a good study that indicating that testosterone replacement therapy might increase the risk for recurrence 
in a patient with briefest history of this uh, prostate cancer. This is the same thing for patient who is only treated by radiotherapy. Again, if he is locally at localized prostate cancer that's that's uh, that's that have been cured by radiation, he can also be benefiting from starting him on testosterone therapy. Uh, thanks, uh, Dr. Abhaye. Thanks, Prof. Saleh. We'll move to the second case. Second case, 58-year-old male. He had history of obesity class 2. That means his BMI between 35 to 39.9, diabetes type 2, hypertension, and dyslipidemia. Started in testosterone tablets nine months ago due to decreased libido fatigue and typical symptoms of hypogonadism and low free testosterone. Today, now, after nine months, he reports normal libido and energy after treatment, no lower uh, urinary tract symptoms. His uh, prostate exam was normal, testosterone level 150. Now, what's the appropriate assessment for osteoporosis in this patient? Clinically, history and exam, DEXA, Prax, or wait for this patient until his age 58 year, uh, to, to until age 65 to screen him, or change to the testosterone injections. So look to the case again. Think what's the best action in the clinic for this patient. This is 58 year old male, had obesity, diabetes, hypertension, dyslipidemia. He was treated by testosterone with typical hypogonadism symptoms. Now he's improved clinically. Exam is normal. Testosterone was low, 150. So, foot, choose the appropriate answer that you will do in your clinic. What's the best? Clinically, history and exam, DEXA, FRAX, or wait a few years only, almost seven years, or change to testosterone injections, uh, and testosterone level was only 150. So, we'll give like 10 seconds, then we'll see. Uh, how many foods so far? Can we stop? 33 out of 87. Okay, we can stop. We can stop. See the results? Uh, okay, now uh, answer. We had more than 57 percentage, uh, no answer, and the majority almost want uh, DEXA, 17%, FRAX, 14%. Clinically, 7% and wait and see. Now, I will start now with the Prof. Saleh. Uh, this patient, 58-year-old male, is on testosterone tablets with typical symptoms of hypogonadism. Now, his testosterone is low. What do you think? Do you will change up to testosterone injections, Prof. Well, so this guy has a decreased libido, fatigue, and a low testosterone, so he fits the 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 diagnosis or confirmatory tests for uh, low testosterone, which is the symptoms and the biochemical evidence. Then they started him on oral testosterone, and after that he started responding. So his symptoms have improved, although his figures are still low. So we're talking about here to total testosterone 150, and the normal should be above 300. On the other hand, he is improving sim from symptom wise. So for me, I will not bother too much about his uh, numbers if the patient is already improving on on the current medication that he is using. But keep in mind that oral tablets can be associated with increasing risk for hepatic dysfunction. So for how long we have to put him on oral tablets, that's something need to be discussed carefully with the patient and you have to be under strict follow up. Uh, now, putting him on testosterone for for his bone uh, mineral density, that's something I will leave it for Dr. Ramhaya. Thanks, Prof. Saleh. Dr. Ramhaya, what do you think? Yeah, so I agree with the, with the, with that, uh, the putting that DEXA scan has to be done. As we uh, discussed earlier, that if you have hypogonadal uh, men above age of 50 who comes to your DEXA scan will be useful tool to a screen for osteoporosis. Uh, some will consider FRAX again. Uh, can we do FRAX without doing DEXA scan? Yes, we don't have to have the input of DEXA scan to evaluate for FRAX. So, but if you have the available uh, option for DEXA scan, I will choose, of course, DEXA scan 
for uh, such a case scenario. Keep in mind that he's having also other factors that are like type 2 diabetes. We know what's the effect of type 2 diabetes in regard, especially if it's poorly controlled, long standing type 2 diabetes has an effect also in the bone health. And perhaps that's one of the other indication for testing BMD in such a uh, case scenario. Thanks, uh, Dr. Mahia. Thanks, Prof. Saleh. We will uh, move. Uh, uh, Dr. Mahia, can, can I just have the liberty now, since we are in this case, just to ask both of you one question that uh, we encounter a lot in our clinics as an endurology clinics. Sometimes you have a patient with hypogonadism or fits the criteria for testosterone replacement therapy. You start him on the treatment. You start with the oral or whatever, like patches or uh, or creams, then you shift to injectable testosterone. But still, his testosterone is not improving and his symptoms are not improving. So both clinically, he's not improving and biochemically, he is not improving, although you are putting him on the maximum testosterone replacement therapy. So in that instances, usually we refer the patient to the endocrinologist. And since you both of you are here, I would like to hear from you what usually you do for a patient who is resistant to testosterone replacement therapy. Dr. Hayya, so, any comment? Yes, so in that regard with the uh, resistance, we have to think of first, uh, does he improve symptom in regard of symptoms? If not, so we have to think of uh, a compliance issue, especially with those tablets or gel or uh, the way of administration. So it's, it's sometimes as uh, having gel or batches, it might be uh, one of that is the compliance or the way of, of route of administration it might be difficult so that we are facing uh, uh, sometimes. Uh, injectable option, uh, it's a good option to, uh, to proceed with. Uh, and with the observation that it has been, what we are doing that, especially in the first cases that, or the first uh, 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 injection, we'll give it in the clinic, observing that we are making sure that uh, injection is taken, then we'll be evaluating that. And uh, perhaps also the biochemical evidence for that, we have to choose the right time, the midway uh, um, between the testosterone injection and the early morning, uh, fasting, uh, so that will be more reliable uh, in regard of testing of testosterone uh, in, in this era. Exactly what the Dr. Amhaya say. Also with the injections, sometimes now we give it weekly or every two weeks and uh, decrease or increase the dose, then assist the patient based on that. Any further comment from you, Dr. Amhaya, Prof. Saleh, or we can move to the next part? Now we're good. Thank you. Uh, now we will move to the almost the last uh, lecture in our presentation with uh, Amgen for a few minutes. Uh, we will speak for with uh, Ahmed Rajouz. He will give us an interesting uh, presentation for almost eight to ten minutes. Then the questions and answers. Ahmed, please start. Uh, can you hear me, uh, doctor? We can hear you fine, Ahmed. Right. Yes, yes, we can hear you. Now my uh, slides. Does it appear? Uh, can you see my slides? Yes, I was. Go ahead, please. So, uh, I would like to thank Prof. Saleh and Dr. Meta, Dr. Mohaya, for giving us the opportunity uh, to be here today. Uh, I'll start my presentation with a quote for Hosley. In 2010, he mentioned that uh, given that osteoporosis in men remain underdiagnosed uh, and undertreated disorder, increasing public awareness of this important cause of mortality and morbidity in men is key to ensure that. As men age, they are spared the consequence of this disabling, but now eminently preventable and treatable disease. So let's start about the uh, approved indication for treatment of osteoporosis. And as Dr. Mohaya gave us an idea, he mentioned that we have uh, uh, alendronates, 
generic alendronates, resedronate, zeledronic acid, dinozumab, and teribartide. And in my presentation, I'll focus uh, on dinozumab. Dinozumab has been approved for treatment of male osteoporosis in Europe in June 2014, and now is recently approved in Saudi Arabia uh, uh, to treat male osteoporosis. So in the institute now in Saudi Arabia, we'll find that uh, male osteoporosis is one of the indications of dinozumab. Uh, speaking today about the ADAMO trial, and the ADAMO trial is a dinozumab in, in men with low bone mineral density. We'll find this, is, uh, this was a two years, two years international randomized phase three clinical trial to assess the effect of dinozumab in male osteoporosis. Funded multi-center randomized double blind placebo control. The primary endpoint was the percentage change from baseline in lumbar spine, BMD at month 12. And the other end point was the percent change from baseline and DMD in total hip, femoral neck, trochanter, and distal one third radius at month 12 and month 24. The exclusion criteria was any severe or more than one moderate vertebral fracture, any vertebral fracture or clinical fracture in the last 16 months before the screening, any disease known to affect bone metabolism. So in the baseline characteristics and uh, characteristics, you'll find that uh, the main baseline in BMD T-score was similar between the treatment group. Uh, I forget to mention that the patient randomized either to receive dinozumab in the first uh, year or placebo. And this part, the first year was double blind. And after that, we have an open label part. Those who are on dinozumab continue on dinozumab. And those who are on placebo who switch it to dinozumab. So we have now two arm, continued arm, who has started dinozumab and continue on dinozumab, or and crossover arm who started on placebo and continued and switch and uh, cross uh, over to dinozumab. So the primary uh, analysis include uh, 131 men, and you'll find that uh, statistically, the dinozumab provide a statistically uh, higher percentage in the pace from baseline in lumbar spine, as you can see here from uh, 12 months, as you can see in the first, first year, dinozumab is the higher percentage change from baseline and lumbar spine compared to placebo. And the B value was very significant, uh, more than less than 0.001. And in this five analysis, dinozumab increased lumbar spine BMD consistently, regardless of the baseline testosterone. So Regardless of the serum level, dinozumab significantly improved BMD. And it also improved uh, BMD regardless of the minimum T score. So, regardless of the baseline T score or the uh, baseline serum concentration, dinozumab increased BMD in all T skeletal sites. And if we look to the open nipple part, the continued dinozumab group demonstrates significant cumulative gain from baseline to month 24 in lumbar spine, BMD, and also in all key skeletal side BMD, compared to the, uh, in the crossover arm, as you can see here, those who started on placebo, then uh, switch it to dinozumab. Dinozumab demonstrates significant increase in lumbar spine BMD, and BMD at all key skeletal sites measured at 24 months, and the B value was 0 0.005, 0.001 in the continued group and 0.05 in the crossover arc. Also, in the other key skeletal sites in the continued dinozumab group, you'll find dinozumab significantly increased BMD in all key skeletal sites in total health, femoral neck, trochanter, and this one three radius. And uh, this was consist consistent among the start of the trial. So in the uh, from the beginning of the trial, in the first uh, first year, the double plant or the open label arm, you find a consistent uh, improvement in BMD in all key skeletal sites. Regarding the adverse event, and this is uh, uh, will be my last my, my last slide. So uh, as you can see here, most of the adverse events are uh, mild to moderate and uh, balanced between the two arm two groups in placebo and the first year or dinozumab or the crossover arm or continued. Uh, continued arc for dinozumab. And as you see, the overall uh, adverse event 
and serious adverse event and fatal adverse event were similar between the two groups. Uh, now I, I finish my presentation. I'd like to thank you. And uh, if you have any questions regarding uh, denosumab use and post and osteoporosis, male osteoporosis, please uh, you can ask or we can open the floor for. Uh, thanks, Ahmed. Now we will move to the last part, which is uh, questions and answers. Uh, so far, no questions. So I will ask again our uh, speakers, please, uh, to be uh, Dr. Mahia, Dr. Prof. Saleh, please uh, back to the scene. I have one question for each one of you before we conclude, unless we receive uh, further questions. Uh, Dr. Mahia, uh, Dr. Uh, Prof. Saleh. Yes. Yes. Uh, Dr. Uh, uh, we'll start uh, with you, uh, Prof. Saleh. Uh, now, are you, as you saw in the briefest lecture with Dr. Amhaya, that uh, one of the main uh, secondary causes for uh, osteoporosis is hypogonadism. What's the usual practice in usual clinic urology? And uh, from your experience and research, is it a practice to assess osteoporosis, especially high mortality, and usually men uh, not treated and not seek treatment, unfortunately? And what's the pract uh, practical point can be done in this regard? Thank you for putting this uh, forward. Uh, an actual fact, uh, osteoporosis and decreased bone uh, mineral density is, as I said at the beginning, is something overlooked by most of the urologists and andrologists when it comes to men's health. Um, and also, unfortunately, I just came to understand now there is no um, local guidelines when it comes to treatment of male osteoporosis. I understand there is a female, but not a male. Uh, maybe because the, the incidence is higher in the female, but probably the incidence in the male is the same, but it, is not, it was not studied at the same level. So usually what people presented to our clinic complaining of, um, of the main issue with them and the, the drive where we usually go and do a, a testosterone level measurement is, is the sexual dysfunction, either decreased in libido or decreased rigidity. So we go and ask for that. And usually we evaluate the patient for prostate health, uh, liver function test, lipid profile, and CBC. But having an assessment for his bone mineral density, this is usually is not a common, I have to say, at least in the in the group where I am working with. On the other hand, it's clearly uh, clearly identified in the guidelines that uh, you have to ask the patient about you have to assess his uh, bone mineral density whenever you have a young male with a testicular dysfunction or even a male above the age of 50 with this testosterone deficiency. This is part of the guidelines and we know replacement therapy for them can improve their uh, their uh, their osteoporosis uh, and decrease the bone density and decrease the morbidity of bone fracture. So that calls, and this is one of the of the aims of this of this webinar is to increase the awareness among our colleagues to consider either referring the patient to the specialist or to ordering uh, a bone mineral density assessment whenever you face a patient with um, hypogonadism, especially if he's above the age of fifty. Thanks, Prof. I think we had many questions. I will delay my question to you, Dr. Mahia. We'll start with you, Dr. Mahia. This is a question from Dr. Mishari. Is there any difference between type of treatment, oral batch injections, testosterone with the patient with osteoporosis? Yeah, so in regard of the, uh, we have uh, plenty of options in regard of uh, uh, the route of administration in regards of uh, testosterone. Uh, if you look for more convenient, uh, Options, of course, the oral or batches perhaps is more convenient uh, in comparison to uh, uh, injectable option. What has been studied more is the injectable option in regard of uh, uh, plateauing of the effect and uh, con uh, consistency in regard of the uh, level of testosterone. So uh, we have to look for other parameter in that regard, which is more convenient. Does this patient have uh, uh, access for injectable option? Uh, shall we start with the oral testosterone if it's available? It's not available everywhere, by the, by the way. Some governmental hospital, we don't have these uh, options. We have only the injectable options. But if you have these options, perhaps it's a good option to start with. If no improvement and in regard of symptoms, you might consider switching to more 
uh, uh, broken therapy like the injectable options. Prof. Saleh, is it available now in any centers? Prof. Saleh? The, the injectable is available. We have the long acting yes, and we have the short acting. But, but unfortunately, about... we, we have only other than the injectable, we have only the oral, the endoreal. Uh, when it comes to the batches, it's not available. The the uh, the creams used to be available. The gel, I mean, and uh, not anymore, unfortunately. Even outside the kingdom, it's uh, it's scanty. Now uh, there is a new formula where you can uh, use it as a nasal spray, but this is yet to be. Uh, it's available outside, but yet to be available also here inside the kingdom. Dr. Hey, other question about uh, fact score and diabetic patients, maybe not directly to our topic. They said it may underestimate the risk of a fracture. Yeah, especially if it's poorly controlled type 2 diabetes, uh, the fracture will, will might underestimate the fracture risk in those kind of patients. And some uh, experts, what has been recommended by some experts is that to click on uh, rheumatoid arthritis. <laughs> Icon, so that perhaps will give you an idea or better estimation in regard to fracture risk assessment. Yes. Okay. Last question for both of you: Can we use oral testosterone in elderly men with low DEXA or only IM? Are we using oral testosterone, Prof. Saleh, in elderly? Is there any barrier? Maybe hepatic side effects? Well, the only thing I would just caution is the hepatic dysfunction with oral formula. So I would refrain from using. Uh, oral uh, uh, oral formula unless if it's uh, if it's contraindicated to use the injectable. What about uh, cardiovascular uh, convocations with testosterone? Uh, I know there are ongoing trials. Final comment, brief. Prof. Now, now the bottom line here: FDA have stated clearly that there is no a concrete or a solid evidence that testosterone replacement therapy increase a worse cardiovascular side effect. There were some few studies have indicated that previously, but after careful revision to those studies, uh, they are not, uh, there was a lot of flaws in their methodology, and you cannot draw a strong conclusion. So the bottom line, it's safe to use it in elderly, provided that their hem hematocrit is less than 0.54%, and you follow them carefully. Uh, Dr. Mahia? Yeah. Just, about... just only one more. Uh, this is not also for a patient with heart failure. This is only for patients, for elderly patients without a science or clinical science of heart failure. Okay, thank you. Dr. Mahia, please. Yeah, Let's I have a further comments in that regard. Mashallah, Dr. Yusuf covered that. So, uh, yeah, we have to be cautious with the hepatotoxicity again with the oral. Uh, unless uh, contraindicated, we will use the uh, injectable option, of course. Uh, last question, maybe uh, Dr. Anwar added a question. What's the place of growth hormone, Dr. Mahia, in management of osteoporosis if there is an adult with a growth hormone deficiency? What do you think, Dr. Mahia? That's really interesting in regard of uh, body mass index, in regard of body composition that has been shown in young population with a growth hormone deficiency. Things will improve in regard of this parameter, in regard of body mass composition. But is it worth to, uh, so again, it's a benefit versus possible side effects or uh, in regard of uh, in injectable option, the cost, what are the other beneficial effects shall we prescribe or not in adulthood? So that's uh, still, uh, again, uh, we have to look uh, uh, for the possible side effects in regard uh, or in contrast to the beneficial effects of uh, such a treatment. So far, we don't have strong recommendation to recommend growth hormone for adult uh, in regard of uh, body mass composition or bone mineral density parameter alone. Uh, by this, uh, I want uh, to appreciate, uh, just to share with you, uh, uh, I want to appreciate, uh, to thank you, uh, Prof. Saleh, uh, for being with us tonight and sharing your experience. Thanks our main speaker, Dr. Mahia. This is a really informative topic, and hopefully it will change the practice in the near future. Thanks for Amgen for uh, hosting this meeting and supporting us. Thanks for all audience who participate with us with their experience and their answers and their questions. 
Thanks to everybody. Have a good night and see you soon in another webinar, inshallah. Please see the, this lecture will be soon in our uh, YouTube channel. And if you want to contact us uh, with the Saudi Society of Men's Health, please. This is, uh, we had uh, Twitter and our channel on YouTube. And we are welcoming anyone to join us as a member in this society. Thank you and have a good night. Thank you.